Audacity, what a beautiful word. The confidence to say or do what you want, despite difficulties, risks, or the negative attitudes of other people. But why is it that people tend to take this in a negative connotation? They also say it means rude or disrespectful behavior. Now, if your teacher were to ask you one day, wow, you have the audacity to question my teaching, what would that remark mean to you? That you were rude or that you were questioned the confines of what you were taught? Now, I think that the latter is true and all breakthroughs we have are structured around such an audacity, an audacity to break social norms, an audacity to discover new things that many people told us didn't exist, or an audacity to keep going despite all those difficulties. Now, people might haphazardly use this term, but there are some of us who embody it. Now, when I work in the lab during long and tedious procedures, I like to put in headphones. Most people like listening to music, but I enjoy philosophy podcasts to keep me up with new scholarship and new ideas for my debate event. And an interesting situation I was in this past summer was when this new episode came out and discussed the dissatisfaction of many thinkers during the Enlightenment period with processes like this. Now, someone, guess what this is? The scientific method. <laughs> yes, the scientific method. And although we might frown upon it while writing a science paper, it's definitely something that has structured science and is valuable. But while listening to this podcast, I discovered that people think that science is futile and processes like this are just useless attempts to understand the natural world. But what I found was ironic was that I was listening to this podcast while conducting science. <laughs> I actively listened to discouragements, whether it be from philosophers in my AirPods or just people around me tell me that the time I invest in science is useless but I'm just more motivated to continue on because this is my passion. And I think it takes a level of audacity to value the input of all the haters around you, but disregard it nonetheless. Now, another example of this was at the end of my freshman year. I was loving science my first year here at American Heritage, and I was definitely growing as a person. And I realized that I wanted a real opportunity at a university lab. So I started emailing every professor I could from our local colleges, such as the University of Miami, all the way to Yale University. But to be quite honest, I was very disappointed with the results. Now, let's take a look at an email I got from a Harvard professor. While I have no idea what American <laughs> heritage is, a connection for you in the more local area would seem to make much more sense. Further, the specificity with which you state your goal rarely, if ever, makes sense for a high school student or a college student. There is art and intellect to science, not just the doing. I am sorry that I cannot offer you a position. Now, I'll be honest, as a freshman, I took it very hardly, but let's take a look at each of these sentences and see what they reflect about society today. The first sentence. We're all consumed by our own issues. My Spanish teacher, Dr. Zaviezo, told us this year that we're all, we all have our own issues. She told us that she has about 80 different things to do every day in response to a student asking her to grade our tests. And she said that her younger daughter wanted to dress up as a cowgirl for a school activity. And to her daughter, it was the most important thing of the next day. But to Profe, it was not high on her list of pressing concerns. <laughs> now, everyone, just take a look at the person right next to you. You may or you may not know them, but they're definitely going through some sort of hardship right now. But do you care? Think about it, right? <laughs> to them, if they're going through an existential crisis, it's the matter of their existence. But you probably do not care because it's not your issue. <laughs> and what this professor, along with Dr. Zaviezo, taught me is that there is a perspective shift per person, as maybe it was just my naivety as a freshman, but I was just concerned about my own issues. To me, American Heritage is the only school that exists because I spent <laughs> about 12 hours here early in the morning studying for my classes and staying late at night to do extracurricular activities. But then there's this Harvard professor who's like, I have no clue that you exist. I have no clue <laughs> that your school exists. I have no clue that you're suffering and you're working hard. And that to me was and is still crazy. Now, the second sentence. A connection in the local area would be best. He was probably trying to be supportive and offering me suggestions, but is this really what we want? Confining students to the same environments doesn't produce new thinking or new scholarship. 
Just think about it. If your parents didn't go to college and you were in the same environments under the same conditions, you probably wouldn't also. But I think that offering students opportunities to be in new places, to be around new people, is what's key. But for some reason, we never do. Now, the third sentence. Now, I'm still outstanding by this, because he probably read my email and thought of it as an act of negative audacity. He must have been like, wow, there's this ninth grader who had to ask me and demanded me for a position in my lab and offered to be in my research. But to be quite frank, I still don't see the issue of the larger concept. To find one goal in research and putting everything into achieving it, having that one motivation is what's key. But he's telling me that we can't have that as a high school student. So then I think to myself, OK, maybe as a college student, I could do that. But according to him, I don't have that freedom even in college. <laughs> so how am I supposed to do what I want to do if I can't do it at any point in my life that actually matters? Now, what's ridiculous to me is that we all have access to the same research and the same publications with the internet, with Sci-Hub. But to him, it doesn't value that we can create the same ideas simply because we're younger. Now, if I was domeless at 26, would you <laughs> offer me an opportunity at your lab? Probably not, or at least hopefully not. <laughs> but the fact remains that He's a big shark in a big ocean. He's the institute, and he's the director of so many different things, I can't even list you as credentials. It would be longer than the slide. But to him, because I'm from a different area and I'm from a different background, it's not sufficient to offer me that opportunity. And I think that this is why we're never empowered. And then the last sentence, a rejection from Harvard, and I'm not even a senior yet. It definitely hurt. <laughs> And I was like, wow, as a freshman, that was, it was definitely tough. But to me, it was time to move on. It wasn't like if the Northeast wasn't going to offer me an opportunity, then I would go to the Midwest. I would go to the Californian coast in order to find any professor to give me that opportunity. And surprisingly, out of the hundreds I sent, only one responded. And he was in neurology and psychiatry. And my entire freshman year, I worked in nephrology. To him, it wasn't a matter of our expertise. He didn't care that he was a brain researcher and I loved the kidney. To him, <laughs> all that mattered was our commonality and our interests and our passions for science. And I was set out to work at Northwestern University this past summer. He, reading my emails, even decided to give me leeway to discover my own project. And in order to do this, I decided to self-reflect and see what's important to me. And I realized that as I was having breakthroughs in understanding myself, Others were, quite frankly, breaking down. One of my closest friends had schizophrenia. Now, I realized that coming into high school, I thought that I would be surrounded by the brightest kids of my age, the most brilliant students who are all motivated for whatever aspiration they have. And she made me realize, along with a lot of other people, that we're all like suffering in our own ways. We all bear the burdens of our worlds with schoolwork, commitments, jobs, and even family issues. Now just raise your hand if you think that you have the slightest dissatisfaction with your life, whether it be with stress or anything else. There are people not raising, oh, well, I wish I was you, but like, <laughs> that's not me as a high schooler. But the fact remains that we should all try to do something to fix that in our own lives. To me, it was science. The defining point was when I realized that I could connect this passion, this new access to advanced equipment, to solve real world issues that me and my friends around me are struggling with on a daily basis. Now, my research consisted in investigating the role of an ion channel family known as hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channels in the prefrontal cortex of schizophrenia. Now, a quick simplification of what I discovered was that there was an increase in this channel in the infralimbic subregion of the brain. Now, if validated and supported, this is a pretty major breakthrough because who knows, maybe in 20 years, we might have a working solution to some of the issues of this uncurable disease. Now, I see many of you awkwardly avoiding eye contact with me, and that's totally fine. <laughs> there might have been some of you who had no clue what I just said. And that's probably the point, that there are students out there conducting research in fields that you might not have even known existed but they're very bright and they love what they do. And I think that most of the times it's students who discover the coolest of things. A 10-year-old who discovered a supernova, a toddler who unearthed a $4 million pendant, 
and a five-year-old who discovered a pulsar. Offering students opportunities is the key, but for some strange reason, we as a society almost never do. And one of the saddest examples of this for me was a few weeks ago at a HOSA conference. Now, what's ironic is that this conference was meant to empower students, to offer them innovations and leadership building skills. And basically what we worked on was splitting up into, school, into groups with other students from different schools in order to create a science fair project in under two hours. Now to me, I was very thrilled. A science fair project, another one? <laughs> I had so many ideas from past investigations and research that I became acquainted with at Northwestern University. And I was like, guys, here are some solutions. And they just looked at me with some of the same looks that I got from a lot of you, and they were not fascinated with the science. At the end, our solution was to create an electrode to stimulate the hypothalamus to end world hunger by the year 2050. Now, this might sound like a wonderful solution, but I, off the top of my head, thought of three very bad medical discrepancies. The first one is that stimulating the hypothalamus probably would not correlate to decreasing hunger. We would probably just overstimulate hunger and recreate all of the impacts that we wish not to occur. The second thing is that, as per our protocol, implantation of that electrode would probably cause death for that patient with bacterial <laughs> infections under a few weeks. And the third thing that I found the most disturbing was that the hypothalamus controls so many more functions, such as sleep or sexual activity, and messing with the hypothalamus would trigger any of these responses. And I went to my student, uh, went to my friends from our school that also conduct science and who are able to discern between feasible and non-feasible solutions. And I was like, guys, we are literally advocating to electrocute the hypothalamus of patients to create insomniac sex monsters, right? And they were like, Emmeline, take a chill pill. It's just a friendly, non-scientific activity. So I did my best and I went back to our group and I helped develop our prototype and create our board. But by the time it came for a presentation, the board that I was standing behind, I was quite ashamed. And the thing is that if any professor had walked past me and asked me any of those questions, I wouldn't have known what to say. And from personal experience, the worst thing about a science fair project is standing with a board and knowing that you need to answer certain questions, but you have no answers to. And I was just dumbfounded. And this lady walked past us, and the kid next to me gave um, our little pitch. And her only question was, so you're going to implant an electrode into my brain? And he was like, yes, and proceeded to explain the intricacies of such a project. And she rudely interrupted him and restated the question with a tone that I thought was very mocking. And I was like, whoa, lady, like, stop, right? This is a conference meant to empower students. You're literally talking about occupations, and you're telling us that we can't do what we want to just because, like, it's not feasible for you. Now, sure, even I discovered some of the issues with such a disease or with such a solution, but it's not sufficient to go up to someone's face and tell them what you're doing is wrong because that's not what an adult is there for. And Elon Musk is currently investing billions of dollars into the same technology for different purposes, but the same processes. And I'm pretty sure she would not have gone up to him and asked him, so you're going to implant an electrode into my brain? Because that would not have worked out. He would have roasted her, but as students, that's not something that we can do. And when a couple of sweaty 15-year-olds who are very tired from building this prototype outside in the sun so propose a semi-feasible solution, it's not sufficient for her. And I realize that this is the truth of our society, that there will always be some bigger fish in some bigger pond, whether it be a philosopher, a Harvard professor, or even an adult at a local conference, to tell you that you cannot do what you want to. And I think that the only solution to people like these and to haters are to engage in small acts of audacity, whether it be discovering new things, innovating new fields, or even unleashing your passions. It's the only thing that we can do because we are the breakthrough. We are the next generation. Oh.